Hello and welcome. My name is Yuri Mason and I'm the moderator of a new series, Artist in Conversation. It's a program by Dutch Culture and with it, we hope to learn more about the shared cultural and political predicament between the Netherlands and other countries. We do this by offering artists from the, uh, different countries the opportunity to have conversations. Every edition of this series consists of two dialogues between an artist from the Netherlands and an artist from another country. Through mutual interest and sharing experiences, we hope to get to know not only the artist and their practices, but also the sector of the country, the environment they work in, and how that influences their practice. So today we are looking at Egypt. And um, to kick that off, let's have a, have a brief uh, look at the state of the country. Um, and for that, we've invited Dalia Dawout from the Dutch Embassy in Egypt. Um, Dalia, are you here? I'm, I'm not sure. I have to say, I'm not sure. Is it Dawout or Dawood? It's Dawood, which is uh, David in Arabic. Ah, very nice. Dawood. Mm -hmm. Great to have you. So I have a quite complex question for you to start off with. The state of Egypt, if you would try to boil down uh, what is happening in Egypt um, at this moment in one word, abstract it down to its, uh, to its present state. How would you characterize, um, uh, characterize the country at the moment? Wow, uh, that's tough. Um, I would say complex. Um, I see Egypt as a complex country with um, a lot of opportunities, a lot of, it's very rich, it's very diverse, it has a lot of creative potential. It also has a lot of challenges, restrictions, censorship. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's very complex. It's also very old, uh, full of layers, uh, everything and its opposite at the same time. And for artists working in Egypt at the moment, um, what, what are kind of the things that would influence their, uh, their practice? What dynamics are at play? Uh, looking from a cultural uh, policy perspective that influences, influences what, artists, uh, uh, what, what the scope is of what artists can do. Okay, artists in Egypt, um, they are restricted by censorship, they are restricted by lack of funding. They are restricted by absence of venues for performances, um, uh, for urbanism and heritage. They are often restricted also by the amounts of uh, um, government organizations and bodies involved in every steps, uh, approvals, procedures, and so forth. But at the same time, um, considering that Egypt is both formal and very informal, this informality creates a lot of room to maneuver and do things. Uh, and this is where there is room to do a lot of things in all disciplines and all domains. I think COVID uh, hardly influenced the sector, same in Egypt like in everyone else. Some organizations had to close, uh, others decided to travel and leave the country, but others, they continue. Unlike other countries, we managed to have many things happen, like uh, festivals, uh, governmental ones and independent ones, like the Cairo Jazz Festival, Animatex, uh, Cairo Tronica, Panorama, Cairo International Festival. So we're restricted but we have potential. Uh, I think artists also need more room for exposure uh, opportunities to practice and to support them to do whatever they want to do without putting additional restrictions on the creative process. Mm -hmm. So a, a platform to, to, to show what, what can be done or to practice, you also said, right? Yeah. Yes, to practice, uh, to perform, to produce. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see any developments in that in that direction? Are you uh, hopeful in this in a way? Yes, we see a lot of development. So basically, what the embassy is trying to do is to support uh, the local scene, 
to help contribute to sustaining it, to give it room uh, to organizations, to practitioners, to come up with new ideas, to support them, and to create rooms for exchange between Egyptians and Dutch, whereby it's a dialogue, it's a conversation. Let's work together on to doing something. And this happens uh, in different forms, uh, like, for example, uh, co-creations, residencies, uh, or uh, performances, uh, or after performances, you do workshops or talks, or for some projects, like with Heritage, the Dutch come and contribute uh, a missing uh, component in a bigger program uh, into how to develop a narrative for a site and so forth. Uh, so what we try to do is to support primarily local artists and practitioners and programs happening on the ground. We support different disciplines, visual art, digital art, performing arts, urbanism, heritage, tangible and non-tangible. Uh, lately, we're getting into design, especially mm -hmm. that also the Netherlands has a great edge in design. Uh, film, music. Um, so we support those activities happening here and we add to them meaningful exchange uh, between local and uh, Dutch practitioner. And I think so far mm -hmm. we have been successful in doing this and making uh, a different, a different, sorry. That's Great to hear, and it's something that really ties into what uh, we're trying to achieve today. Also, with this uh, with this platform of conversations. Um, thank you, thank you, Dalia, for joining us. We're going to go to two conversations with artists from Egypt and the Netherlands. And um, uh, uh, thank you uh, again. Uh, Our first conversation today will be between Nat Muller and Mahmoud Khaled. Mahmoud is an artist who explores identity and intimate dynamics while questioning the structures that produce them. Born in Egypt, his work has been presented at numerous international exhibitions such as the Sharsha Biennale and Istanbul Biennale. Nat Muller is an independent curator, writer and academic, living between the UK and Amsterdam. She is an expert in contemporary art from the Middle East and curated shows at the Venice Biennale, I Film Museum Amsterdam and the IFA Gallery in Berlin, amongst other venues. Hi, Mahmoud. Great Hi. that you're here. Hey, how, how are you doing? I'm very good. How are you? Um, fine, thank you very much. Where do we find you today? Uh, in Berlin. In Berlin, great, great. And... Um, Mahmoud, I think we um, uh, would like to invite you to uh, share a, a picture that you wanted to uh, submit, right, to kick off uh, our talk. Please tell us what are we what are we looking at? Yeah, it's um, this picture. I, um, I uh, it's a it's a it's a picture of a painting and uh, part of the collection of the uh, Alexandria Museum of Fine Arts in um, in Alexandria. And the first time I saw it was in. 2013, I guess. Um, there was it has a very I have a very special relationship with this painting, and it um, it helped me a lot to get over a certain block that I was dealing with um, for a longer period for for a long period in, in the studio. Um, the painting, the title of the painting is um, uh, "Painter on a Study Trip," and as we can see, it's uh, we see a painter in a ho on a horse. Um, in starting a trip in the nature, going to find a subject to paint, and his assistant is carrying all the all the material, the canvases, and uh, you know the brushes and everything. So, where um, what what I really love about this painting is that it's um, uh, co monumentalizing or commemorating the moment of starting a new artwork, the moment of starting um, um, the. the trip uh, to look for a new subject, for a new inspiration. And uh, this was the artwork itself. So we don't see a subject as such in the painting. We don't, we don't see like a model, like the models here or the, the, the figures in the painting, they are not represented as figures, but they are 
represented as people looking for subject. Um, and this is what actually uh, opened the big door for me to um, rethink about all the stuff that has been, you know, kind of um, delaying my uh, productivity for, for a while, which of course it, it has a lot to do with the time you have to put the context also uh, for this. Um, the, the, the blockage I was talking, the block I was talking about is uh, related to all, you know, the stuff that we dealt with after 2011, the um, mm -hmm. demonstrations and the political um, uh, uprisings and demonstrations in Egypt and in the region around it and also in the world, in Spain and many other places. I think it was a very special timing for my generation that um, made us rethink um, all the stuff that we have been um, believing in, in art and politics and um, even like the positions we used to speak from. Uh, in, in what in what way did it form a uh, in what way did it form a block for you? Um, you know, like in situations like this, you have to deal a lot with failure and death and like many like strong things that we not like. I think my generation were not was not confronted with it before, and um, so we couldn't like I personally couldn't just keep going as usual and go to the studio and find my own you know like research subjects and. Uh, motivations and interests so it was it was also a question of what is the urgency of art and you know all these like strong doubts that you um, deal with after a certain uh, major events uh, so that's why the um, the visit to this museum was really good because this painting and it, this painting was produced by an Italian painter who used to live in Alexandria uh, in the late uh, uh, end of 19th century um, and it was not considered as a major, you know, like an important piece in the collection, but the conceptual impact of the work uh, uh, made a huge um, uh, effect on me. And uh, I used it as a point of departure for a solo show. It was my first exhibition uh, in Egypt after this long period of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. struggle and um, um, dealing with uh, complications, political complications, and uh, things that you need to understand as an artist and as a citizen. Um, so yeah, so that's basically the, um, the work that I wanted, the, the image that I wanted to share. It's very interesting. And we're also looking at, a, at a, a not only the painting, but also the painting as captured on your phone, right? Something yeah. I'd love to hear more about. But let's also bring in um, our other guest, um, uh, Nat Muller. Nat, uh, join us. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Great that you're here. You've been um, uh, you've been listening, right, to what we've been uh, saying so far. Um, what 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 kind of um, what kind of uh, connections do you see uh, when when hearing what uh, what Mahmoud is talking about? Oh, I was just surprised. Um to hear you uh, say, Mahmoud, that you experienced such um, a blockage because you've been so productive as I've been following your career in exhibiting. But I was um, actually interested to ask you, uh, because since it's been a decade now since the, the mm -hmm. uprisings in Tahrir, and um, that must have been quite a, a milestone in, in how you uh, and, and you know your friends and your community have experienced it. So um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, what that commemoration meant. Um, and I, I also understand that when um, it all happened, people were so active and everyone went out in the streets. But is there now, after 10 years, a moment that you've been able to reflect more on what happened and has that also found a way into your practice? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, very, um, it's very funny because now I feel like we, myself and many other people, also my colleagues and friends, we're dealing with, after 10 years, you know, we're dealing with another uh, blockage, but for completely different reasons, like the virus and the pandemic and the fact that life is imposed and uh, again, we had to re-question the urgency of art and uh, why are we doing what we're doing and to whom and the audience and all this. So it was a bit, uh, and especially, I mean, experiencing the pandemic in places in Europe, especially in, in Berlin, for example, where actually life is, was on, on pause for a long time. 
you're not allowed to see art, you can't go to museums, you know, like all the stuff that we normally travel to Europe to do is like, we're not allowed to do it. So this, this brought back this, um, all these doubts and uh, like the urgent questions to the floor again, like how to rethink what we're doing and uh, how can we again find urgency in this. So it's a cycle that took 10 years and came back like same set of questions, but for completely different reasons and on a completely different scale. Now I think we're dealing with it on a more like global and, uh, you know, of course, scientific uh, uh, health uh, kind of thing, but it's also politicized uh, and, and they politicized everything around us. Um, and of course, uh, it's, it's first of all, it's quite shocking to realize that it's 10 years has been passed. You know, it's, uh, it went so fast and uh, we still, I think all of us were still uh, trying to figure it out, like really happen, like a decade had, had passed and, uh, um, I feel like we're, we, with the way we think about uh, political engagement and uh, activism and social change and all these things is completely different. And uh, in the, and also, there's a lot of like new young artists and uh, like new generation of activists and you know like artists and they they, they they speak a different language. They have different statics. They have also a fresh way of thinking about activism and. So this is, I, it was interesting to, to look back at all this and realize all what happened and uh, how different we are and how different everything around us is. And, and do you feel that um, that those 10 years of, um, well, brewing of all these dynamics and politics, has that also seeped in differently into the art scene in Egypt? Because a lot of things have changed in terms of, I mean, the repression has gotten uh, more more harsher. Um, many institutions have also struggled also in terms of getting foreign funding and all these um, curtailments. So um, has that also shifted that dynamic in cultural production? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I think it's something that uh, like you can share with me because you have experienced the art scene in Egypt in a certain time when things were completely different than now. Uh, so yes, actually, this is quite heavy when I think about it. It's like it leaves me with like a heavy heart, and uh, when I think about the situation right now, the scene is completely changed. Not necessarily for better or worse, but it's not the scene that I signed up for. It's not mm -hmm. the scene that me and my colleagues we um, we wanted to be part of, and we worked really hard to be part of. You know, it's uh, this is gone, and I'm not so happy about that to be honest. So uh, what has come in its place? Um, wh where do you see the lack or the loss? It's uh, kind of like a depoliticized scene. I'm not saying that our like moment was super political, but there was like an, a lot of attempts to make it political and to engage with questions related to the, you know, the um, contemporaneity of uh, of the city and the complexity of it and all this. But right now you have a lot of uh, it's like a pure neoliberal kind of structure of a cultural production um, format. Um, you know, you have a lot of like, I mean, there's a lot of homes being built right now. We have a lot of compounds in the desert. The city is expanding and these homes need art. Mm. They, like people, they don't like to live in, in houses with uh, white walls and therefore they need a production that can cater this kind of production of homes and real estate companies and all this uh, expansion of the city and this is not necessarily something that <laughs> I'm interested in and uh, I mean it's okay but I don't want this to be like the first the only uh, kind of uh, line or channel in, mm -hmm. in the cultural scene and also there's this kind of um, agreement between unspoken agreement between what are you doing and what the, the authority wants or agrees. Mm -hmm. So there is like always like the need to go like hand in hand. You know, there is uh, very, very little room for confrontation, for controversy, um, which is something that we also like even during Mubarak, during, uh, you know, before we, we, we really were thinking all the time how to play it correctly, how to be, how to speak about political issues without ending up in jail. And this is, I think, it's it's uh, it's shaping the kind of statics that comes out coming out of Egypt. But uh, but right now, I don't see this effort happening. 
in but the world. Do you think that that effort is um, possible now at this stage, or, or has it become so restrictive and repressive that that room for maneuver is almost impossible? I think, uh, of course, it's harder than before, but I think every level of repression like is pushing for different statics, but this work must happen, you know, like how to understand the, the level of, you know, um, uh, power that you're dealing with and how this, how can you speak about that in a different way? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying, I mean, it's, it's, it's there, of course, it's harder than before and things are completely different, but I think there's a very little, I'm not I'm trying not to be judgmental here, but it's, uh, I, I see very little work happening in trying to deal with this power and to deal with this repression. Uh, mm -hmm. Even it can be in a very poetic, uh, like uh, gesture, you know, kind of thing, but it doesn't have to be like uh, straightforward activism, of course, uh, but this effort must be there. Uh, and that's what I think is lacking in the scene right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey uh, Nat, uh, on that, we also, uh, asked you when considering Egypt, uh, Egypt and, and the Netherlands, what image sprung to mind, what you would like to share. And you also submitted um, a, a particular image. What? Well, not so much <laughs> about Egypt. I, I was asked to um, submit a significant image. And admittedly, this is a bit of a lazy image because <laughs> it's basically the view from my window. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which has been the view for the past 16 months. And uh, Mahmoud, I don't know how you have experienced uh, the past 16 months, but I guess we're both in the art world and we're used to, in a way, hypermobility, hypervisibility, hyperproductivity, and then all of a sudden this pandemic happens. And um, none of that is possible, or at least none of that is possible as we're used to. Um, so, um, yes, I've basically not been able to, to move and, and travel. And um, what is different here is that I have plants. And I never had plants in my life because uh, I was traveling too much. And all of a sudden, um, there was this real desire to bring life in, in a rather dark situation and um, green the four walls that um, have been, um, well, basically... The place I'm, I'm, I'm thinking and, and you know interacting with people over screens for the past 16 months and um, you might Mahmoud also uh, recognize the postcard which is by uh, Lebanese artist uh, Mazen Kerbej yeah. uh, and um, it's a funny postcard it basically uh, shows a, a guy in a bar and it says uh, Malik al Bar king of the bar and, and something similar to I'll stop drinking when the bottles run out or when I get rid of the bottles um, but uh, it's also uh, this postcard, which I got in Beirut in 2019, and there is perhaps a nice link with um, uh, the uprisings in um, Egypt 10 years ago. The last time I was in Beirut in 2019 was when in Lebanon the uprising started, um, which was also um, a very interesting example of um, a cross-generational, cross-sectarian a movement of uh, people getting out on the streets and having um, more than enough with the authorities and desiring um, justice and um, uh, just a, a decent uh, way to live, but which was also um, dramatically crushed. So um, I think it's also a reminder, it keeps also reminding me that um, Sometimes uh, I think the work of cultural worker ends and, and something else comes in that place. I think we saw that in Egypt when artists and cultural workers went out on the streets and um, were political agents rather than artists at that moment. And the same happened in Beirut where everyone said, well, now is not a time for art. Now is the time for us to go out on the streets and, and have our voices heard in a different manner and there was a lot of negotiation of you know how do we as an artistic community negotiate that and deal with that and should we you know immediately as we saw so what happened in um in egypt react and make work because you know when a thing like this happened very often foreign funders also jump in and want to have an immediate mm -hmm. uh, reaction so um i think these dynamics are really interesting uh, to think of, um, but definitely now at the time of um, 
closure, let's say, or, or, or you know, where territories shrink uh, physically, but I think also to an extent uh, mentally because of the pandemic, um, it's good to see those wider this wider picture and that dynamic. Is it is it also Mahmoud to do with uh, in, in related to do with that block you were talking about? Was it a block because you wanted to do something else, or? Um, uh, but just like the, I think the block was related to the complications of the situation. It's mm -hmm. Like everything's so complicated, and uh, but complicated not not because you know the politics are completely you know difficult to understand, but also we're dealing with uh, death and the normalization of death and violence. Uh, as part of the process, and this was also hard to deal with, and as like we we've been like raised up in like especially during Mubarak for thirty years as like the peace generation, you know, like we have no, we never experienced violence before, and this was the first time to see violence and death and blood as part of the daily life and as part of the process of social social change, and uh, so things were literally complicated, uh, and this. It was just too much to process. And also, um, things were moving so fast, and uh, like you don't have a position. Like, we, I, I remember, I think, like most of us as you know, cultural workers, artists, we do have a position in the world. We have certain opinions about things, and we speak from this position. And that's what makes us you know, have a certain language and, and, um, and things to, to say. Uh, it was very difficult to find this position during this uh, process. Um, things were moving so fast and you were doubting all your ideas all the time. Um, so that's why you didn't know from where you can stand and speak as an artist. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, but yeah. Very much in a, in, a, in a reality that seems so distant from what we are looking at from that window still. And, uh, but I can relate to the window too. I mean, with, the, <laughs> with the pandemic and the plants, yeah, it's totally, yeah, totally understand what you're talking about, Matt. Yeah, but also I, I felt I, I needed something also to, uh, in a sort of micro level, to take care of. Yeah. Um, you know, just to have something that you can just, you know, water from time to time and see it grow. And, and, and because I think so much. Um, in our practice has slowed down and, and that in and by itself is already disconcerting because I think, you know, the art, the art world can be seen as a quite, you know, rushed, high paced environment and all of a sudden that sort of sinks um, to an almost level of stasis. Mm. Um, which is very disconcerting, um, but to a degree, and I don't know how you experienced that, Mahmoud, uh, there's this continuous uh, fear of missing out that, um, you know, the art world always <laughs> wax, uh, wax you on the head with. Uh, that was gone to an extent. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know how you um, have experienced this or, or were you also able to work? For me, the first few months were just scary. I was writing a chapter on the apocalypse and we were living in the apocalypse. Yeah, so that was also uh, very strange somehow. Yeah, it's so funny because, you know, all these things that we, like the images and the scenarios we used to have in our heads, like we, we used to read the novels and books about like the apocalypse and uh, empty cities and the theatricality of whatever. All this was reality. You know, like all the things that we used to staticize in our work and our ideas and writings and stuff, it was actually like our cities were like this. Our cities were abandoned, deserted, uh, totally. And we're talking about cities that we never experienced uh, that way. Um, so it was a bit kind of like, um, it was a bit surprising. It was quite uh, uh, uncomfortable to deal with for a while. But um, I was not able to work, to be honest. No, it was... A bit of like again, I dealt with another block uh, for completely different reasons. But uh, the good thing is that I was I had a book to work on, so it was nice to work on um, on a book, not an exhibition or something physical that mm. requires audience. So it was nice to work with writers and uh, my co-editor and uh, editing texts and doing Skype meetings. So it felt quite suitable for the situation to be locked in a room and working on ideas with other people via screen. Um, but uh, but now I feel, now it, it's been like we're entering, almost finishing the second year. Yeah. And it feels like, I feel like I'm like a different person from the person who used to be, you know, before 
like biennials, art fairs, and, and flight tickets and stuff like this. Like, I don't like, we all changed, and this felt, it feels like another life, you know, like very far away, like. Uh, um, I also so, wanted yeah. to ask, yeah, because you've been in, um, for the whole duration of the pandemic, you've been in Germany. Or and not in, Cairo, of it. in Cairo. In, in Cairo. Yeah. Um, but now you're in Berlin doing a residency, and yeah. um, maybe as a sort of uh, closing uh, point to, to discuss, a lot of your work also delves into queer politics. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, you spoke about how you know, artists in Egypt have always found ways how to bring certain contentious issues into their practice hmm. poetically or covertly or, or in a very sort of um, uh, complex way. Um, and does being in Berlin um, change your practice when you work, for example, on queer politics? I mean, knowing your work, I suppose there's also some projects that you would not be able to show in Cairo or in Egypt. So I was just wondering about that dynamic because I very fondly remember the fantastic U project uh, you did for the Istanbul Biennial in 2017, which very much touched on that um, topic, but was also, you had to understand the cultural references in a sense to get the full narrative. Yeah. No, thank you for the questions. Um, um, it's complicated because I, I understand, yeah, I understand this, um, I always think that the fact shaped my my work a lot. The fact that I'm I'm working from Egypt and I do like all most of these ideas coming from Egypt. The way I think about queer identity and uh, sexuality and all this within the Egyptian context and from within the Egyptian context, um, it shapes the work in a different way and it comes up with like aesthetics that I wouldn't be uh, able to produce if I'm working uh, from San Francisco, for example. You know, and this is something I value a lot right now. I mean, at this point of my career, I appreciate the value of this. Before, I wasn't aware of it. Um, first of all, I feel like all the works, are, like any work I produce or I work on, I only think that it's possible to show in Egypt. I want to believe that it's possible to show, unless it's conceptually designed not to be shown in Egypt, like the Istanbul piece, because it's about exile. So it can happen anywhere in the world except Cairo because it's about leaving home. Um, but any any other work, and I managed somehow to, to show most of the works in Egypt in different situations and it was okay um, so far. So, um, but I always want to believe that it's possible to do, uh, to show it in Egypt because it it shapes the work in a different way. If I remove this from the work, the work will be will become like something else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's, it's also been a very uh, rough year, I think, for the LGBTQI community in Egypt with the suicide of uh, Sarah Igazi, the, the, the activist, and um, Mashrua Leila, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Lebanese band, um, which is headed by a gay frontman being banned. Um, so, so that was also very much a, a discussion point, I think, the past year as well, no? Absolutely. And uh, again, like we're talking about generations and new generations doing things in a different way. Uh, like we, I wouldn't like think about how they come up with solutions, how they they defend their arguments and debates and political debates and stuff like this. And this is something I'm really learning a lot uh, right now, all the time. Um, and that's kind of troubling me as an artist in a good way as well. So it's not just like, you know, because sometimes they know, also, people think that being queer is enough. You know, it's not enough. It's like there's a lot of. Uh, it's like an ongoing um, complication that you need to deal with, and you need to listen to how like new people are speaking about it as well. Um, so yes, it's been a tough year, and uh, and also for for my generation, just to 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 close this on this note, um, for my generation, we feel like we had like somehow worked for like substantial amount of time, like let's say 10 years or something on a certain thing in order to understand it. And that's never enough. When you finish, like at some point you feel like all your argument is very old dated and uh, there's a new generation speaking about things in a different language. And um, and you, you actually have to re-question everything. Mm -hmm. And also things happening, like the Queen boat that happened 20 years ago, this year was the 20th, 20th uh, anniversary. 
And the queen boat, if people doesn't they don't know about it, it's like the Egyptian it's considered like the stone wall of yes. Egypt, like the most uh, important event in the queer community, a queer history. Uh, so it, when, when many it, gay men got arrested on on a boat, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. fifty two men. Um, so yeah, so if this is like if this is an iconic event that we are still after twenty years trying to work on, reflect on it, processes process it, uh, trying to learn how to speak about it, how to document it, how to narrate it for, you know, for ourselves, for for new, for next generations, whatever. And then in the meantime, a lot of things has been happening that you need to also focus on, like Sarah Gezi, the Mashrua Layla, and uh, many other raids, and that was like orchestrated in different ways. So it's uh, it's quite tough, you know, like mm -hmm. the whole thing. But this is that what makes you also, you know, inspired and, and working uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. It's so, a yeah. wonderful note to close on, Mahmoud. And I could have spoken with you for many, many more minutes. So we I need think we need to close. <laughs> yes, yeah. We need to meet soon in real right. life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mahmoud uh, Nat, for uh, for joining us uh, and for this uh, for this inspiring talk. Lots of connections uh, to be made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to um, continue with uh, two further guests we uh, we brought on. Uh, the first uh, guest is Michelle Provost. She's an architectural historian specialized in urban planning history, post-war architecture and urban development. And she co-founded uh, the Office of Crimson Architectural Historians in uh, 1994. Welcome, Michelle. Great to have you. And um, uh, our second guest, Omar uh, Nagati, an architect and urban planner who co-founded Cluster, an urban design and research platform in downtown Cairo. Hello, Omar. How are you? We are not hearing you at the moment, Omar. Is something with your... Yeah, I just... Turned... Perfect. Um, where, where do we find you at the moment, Omar and uh, Michelle? Well, I'm in Rotterdam. At my I'm in Cairo. Yeah. In Cairo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Cairo. We, 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 as you said, we were located in downtown for 10 years. We just moved outside downtown for a reason we can talk about. So I'm in a new space and I just installed my library in the back, which was in there. I see there's, there's a clear connection already in the, the, in the, in the, in the backyard. Hey, um, we invited you to show a significant thing with both of you. Uh, I'm going to kick off actually with a video. Super diversity of crime in the edge of opportunity. What I want to explore with my project is to offer perspectives, uh, the bird gaze, um, how these animals are actually perceiving the city from above, but also from the pavement. It focuses on a specific location in Rotterdam, which is the Wena Street, and on three different speculative projects. So in this um, pocket guide um, of getting lost, I have focused um, a lot on uh, the visual uh, language. I developed a board game, it's called On Capo City, um, and the intention is to uh, help people envision and debating different attitudes uh, towards sustainability in the city. So you have this really stark contrast between people just passing by and going to the cars and these like really precious objects that play them. There is a disconnection between the Rotterdam Harbour and the city of Rotterdam, between different migrant groups in the city, and what especially interests me, between nature and culture, between humans and non-humans. Derek writes that there will be a denier in all of us, but what I believe is that there is also a post-humanist in all of us, and that's also something what, what brings us together.
Yeah, I thought I should show you this, Omar, because um, I think we uh, we met before. Um, I'm not sure in what year, but it's a couple of years ago, and uh, we talked about the the plans that we had for starting a school. And now it's started, so I can tell you everything about it, but maybe it was easier uh, for you to understand what we're actually doing by showing this uh, small clip. And um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the whole period of Corona uh, was for a lot of people a sort of, uh, well, um, a, uh, a seizure, um, um, a completely different world, um, also the lack of a lot of things. But um, for us, it was a co due, because of the school, uh, it was something completely different. It was like a, a moment in time where we could actually concentrate. And mm -hmm. uh, we decided to just, you know, move forward with these uh, activities and um, um, have three months of really concentrated thought and um, and discussion and create this learning community. So I actually really enjoyed it. And I hope you did something, um, well, something similar maybe or something. I'm not sure how your time was, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, thank you for sharing this. Yeah, of course. I recall our encounter in Cairo a couple of years ago, right before the corona started, we did discuss poss possible collaboration. And I think mm -hmm. this is very uh, appealing and I'm really jealous. I would like to join at some point. With the, but I would like maybe to step back and uh, maybe build on the conversation between the previous two artists, which was in a way set the, the context, set the stage for, for what, what we're talking about. I think mm -hmm. we can always talk about the last year and a half and Corona, but I think uh, from Cairo and I think in globally, we need to look at what is wrong with our cities even before Corona. I think there is a, as, as the previous guest said, there is a sort of a new liberal paradigm that is uh, uh, governing our cities and it's been there for three, four decades and uh, creating all these uh, condition of injustices uh, from housing and transportation services, including the art culture scene. So I think uh, people tend to think of the global south and the global north or Europe and the Middle East are having very distinct uh, conditions. Of course, there are specific uh, conditions for each, but there are also a lot of common grounds mm -hmm. that people need to acknowledge and in a conversation. And I think uh, this is, a, uh, I would like maybe that sort of a, a segue to a project that we had started three years ago with the Dutch support to look at what we called grounded urban practices. And that's a discussion I would like to maybe engage Michelle because the, 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 the independent school to me is a manifestation of that. What grounded urban practices is by definition is our alternative initiatives and practices engaging the cities that are in a way fed up with the corporate mainstream neoliberal paradigm and trying to do something that is critical, is experimental, but it's also uh, that is grounded or community-based. And, and I think uh, th this project that we started, uh, we looked at Cairo and Amsterdam and Rotterdam competitively and we produced a, a publication. I'm just going to show you a quick image of it. Here it is. Uh, and, and we did mapping of maybe a dozen or so as samples of initiatives in Cairo and Abbas and Rotterdam. And after that, we did in Berlin and now we're doing in Bogota. We think this is a global movement. There is this interest in, uh, in, in, in developing alternative frameworks and vision. And I think uh, maybe Michelle can tell us a little bit about the independent school. What was the vision behind the school and what is the but the, the modus operandi, how, you know, how did you develop the curriculum? How do you uh, select yeah. the instructors? What is your business model, which is very important because we all want to do something alternative, but it's not sustainable, it's always dependent on grants. And so maybe you can talk to me a little bit about the specific mecha mechanics of the school. Maybe you can copy that in Cairo. Yeah. Can you copy that in Cairo? That's a good question. Well, actually, we started it, um, it was not our first choice. The first choice was actually to, um, uh, look for a position in the university, uh, preferably the University of uh, Technical University of Delft, to get a position there and to um, um, teach what we have been um, practicing over the last 20 years, which is a combination of critical engagement with uh, societal issues, um, but rooted in uh, an awareness of history and culture. 
and uh, we were unable to find such a position and uh, after uh, trying for uh, um, well quite some time uh, we decided okay then we'll start our own school so we basically started without a business model and mm. i uh, while this size sounds very unwise i think it is in fact the the secret behind all of our uh, projects not so secret anymore um, because I think uh, just to start a project like that and to invest in it yourself and then by showing to other people that it is uh, something uh, worthwhile, that is when you uh, get support for it. So uh, we basically started in 2018 um, uh, organizing different courses in studios. But we had to tweak it, tweak it a lot. Um, uh, but without going too much into the details, it developed into um, uh, a school which is supported by uh, architectural offices in Rotterdam uh, mm -hmm. that are sort of members of our school and that the support us financially. Uh, the participants in our studios also uh, pay a fee, but it's we keep it very low because of course we don't want to keep it uh, as open to anybody as uh, possible and we get um, uh, subsidies from uh, funds that are from the municipality and from uh, national funding so uh, that is the business model by now um, but to go back to the content we were um, our main course that you just saw the, the clip of is called Dirty Old Town. And it's a reaction, uh, also a critical stance towards um, uh, the direction that many cities are taking. Maybe you know also of the Smooth City project by uh, Failed Architecture by René Boer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of our cities are sort of cleaning up their centers. Um, and um, all of the, the, I'm talking about Western European cities now, uh, so they uh, they attract um, uh, visitors, tourists, uh, expats, and they have cleaned up their act and even become sort of a uh, yeah a, a city lounge, a green city. Uh, well, you you know all the, the marketing slogans, but um, the periphery of our cities is also slowly um, sort of morphing into. Um, uh, I'm not going to say the sort of the garbage bag, but Everything that is not fitting in this smooth image is sort of pushed out. And this uh, this dirty old town that, by the way, we love, that is the kind of ambiguity that in the city um, makes the identity and creates this, uh, um, yeah, the, the deeper rooted uh, um, yeah, identity of the city. That is what we love and that is what we want to investigate. And that is why uh, you saw in the clip these three um, uh, issues. Uh, the um, inequality that is part and parcel of all our cities. Um, how does it manifest itself in, in the city and how, what can you do against it? Uh, super diversity and migration and the Anthropocene, uh, mm. which proved to be quite, uh, I think the last theme, the Anthropocene was actually the most uh, eye-opener of these themes. Mm tell you a little bit more about it if you want to but i think especially this inequality and uh, finding alternatives to these neoliberal practices that our cities are being built with uh, that is a huge uh, topic in our uh, different studios so the financial mechanisms for instance behind it mm. fascinating well i mean this is this is a very interesting point of connection because you're talking about uh, sanitizing the center and turning it into a space for tourism, etc., and then leaving all the pushing all the dirt and all the uh, sort of unnecessary, undesirable activities outside. In in Cairo, it's, we're having something a little bit of reverse, but it's also similar in a way. And if I may elaborate and maybe connect to Mahmoud's comment, now ten years ago we had a political upheaval, and we were all part of it. Uh, and that's what's happening mainly, not exclusively at the city center, Tahir Square and downtown. The new states, uh, after the revolution, took notice of that and, and realized that the city center is too messy and mm. potentially uh, also uh, dangerous because it's uh, unruly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, over the past, uh, let's say, six, six, seven years, there has been a very systematic attempt to relocate the city center uh, to a new capital, but also new suburbs. Uh, and in doing so, there's uh, uh, two things are happening. A, 
to hollow out the city center, to move all the ministries, all the uh, museums, or the big headquarters, etc., cultural centers to the outside, banks, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and reversely, conversely, uh, try to stand downtown into all like an open museum, like beautiful architecture, but it's completely sanitized. No street vendors, no activists, no uh, uh, sort of uh, troublemakers. Uh, no. So I, I would like maybe use this opportunity to maybe show a small clip of a project that we started with when we first started in 2012 after the revolution. And in a way, it, it could be an entry point to this question of what do we do with the city center? And in a way, mm -hmm. dovetails with a larger question, which is also another commonality uh, with informal, informal practice, informal urbanism. Uh, yeah. In the global south, we can talk about housing and street vendors. And in, in Europe, we can talk about migrants, uh, informal sort of markets, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So maybe if somebody can help us uh, to show this one minute clip. So what you see here, is a, a time lapse of one minute of 24 hour cycle of a sidewalk. This used to be our office from our balcony. And what you can see here is a, a very interesting pattern of uh, informal actors organizing themselves internally uh, and responding to a lot of things, the passers by to traffic, to police raid, to rain. Uh, and it's, it, 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 it is in a way uh, portrayed as uh, chaotic as undesirable, messy things. But there is an underlying structure in informality that tried to capture here. And we've done a lot of work about analyzing the rule system governing this, like who cleans after, who decides the distance between them, et cetera, et cetera. And what's really interesting about this project is street vendor, because they, of course, represent informal economy, which is 50% of GDP. But more importantly, is that street vendor occupy usually the sidewalk, and the sidewalk and that's a clear distinction between uh, Egypt and the global south and, and Europe. It's the margin between the private and the public. And in, in, in Amsterdam and Berlin and Northern Europe, it's more regulated, sometimes over-regulated, right? You know what's, what's possible, what's not possible. Whereas in Cairo, there's a gray zone of possibilities. And what you can do, cannot do, depends on many things. Depends on who you are, which time of the day, your gender, class, uh, subject position, etc. Uh, what, who are you going to, etc. And and to me, this kind of uh, uh, contingency or fluid space is something we want to explore by looking at street vendors as uh, 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 an entry point. Anyway, I just want to maybe throw that back to you. And because we are now, as Mahmoud says, we're 10 years after, many things have changed, but informality is here to stay. And it's still a big question with the state. What do you do with informality? If 70% of the city is built outside planners, with outside architects, mm -hmm. you cannot get rid of it overnight. It's four decades of accumulation. And there's an image, maybe Kaya can share it, with the public house, the informal housing. So you cannot really get rid of it, but you cannot also accept it as an alternative because it's very conservative. It's about private actors pursuing private interests. So there's a role of the state, but it has to be a democratic, strong state. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about the, the, the policy, public policy and urban policy in the city center and how are you guys dealing with it as a, as a practitioner, but also as an academic? Yeah, but first, um, I'm, I'm wondering, because this time lapse is fascinating, of course, you can watch it over and over again, because so much happens. And uh, there's so much actors who all have their uh, own role, like you're saying, and uh, it's, uh, in fact, a very organized thing. But um, if you say, uh, you can't get rid of this informal uh, uh, housing and environment, etc. So, um, apart from creating awareness of it, what what mm. actually uh, do you want to? Um, is there is there something you want to achieve with um, portraying this and creating this awareness? Yes, that's a very important question. So, our approach is, <laughs> as I said, uh, we cannot romanticize informality because it's not uh, it's not an answer. It's very conservative. Mm -hmm. You need you need a spirit of guardian of public good, the state, right? But you cannot also get rid of. So what do we do? So what we are what we're doing in our work is try to first engage it and understand how it works, the underlying system, right? Whether housing, the street vendors, or the traffic, etc. And he said, if this practice condition is going to be there for the last next 10 to 20 years or so until the state is back and 
The first thing is to unlock it, to understand it, unravel it, because we don't study it at school. It's completely dismissed as chaotic, as negative. Mm -hmm. as, after you do that, we try to, to develop ways for you to work with it, intervene critically, but also on a very small scale. So we did a project with uh, with ATH in Zurich called Housing Car, where we worked with the students for two years in an informal area. We tried to understand the typology of this housing structure and what would be ways to, you know, uh, improve it, you know, from an environmental perspective, from privacy perspective, just a little bit improvement without disrupting the whole system. So rather than raising the whole thing and building a new capital or a new district on its own, on the tabula rasa, you accept that this is already has its own intelligence, but, it, but there is room for improvement. And that's the role of us, to work with the local actors, contractors, residents, community leaders, and introduce some ideas to make the already existing project that is happening on the ground already as we speak, to make it a bit better. And that's to yeah. me, our approach to the city. Yeah. I think the uh, the difference that you uh, painted between the the formal and the informal systems uh, in uh, in Cairo is so huge. It's hard to imagine uh, from a Western uh, European perspective with uh, the the state. Um, um, what is this uh, organization called again? The state organization that is in charge of all the housing, sort of completely cynical. Um, uh, well, um, transforming the, the the city in a way that everything new, uh, all housing, all all shiny things are put outside. Uh, I was also um, uh, struck by this in, insistence on heritage in Cairo that you uh, have, mm -hmm. because um, uh, when I was when I was there and lecturing on uh, these new towns around Cairo that have been built there in the last 20, 30 years. I remember this one um, reaction of the students, which were housed in uh, in one of those completely new concrete, uh, barren places in the desert. And she uh, asked me this question. I was completely uh, surprised. She said, uh, "But if you um, if you're building a completely new town, why do you want to uh, insist on keeping your heritage? You want everything shiny new, right?" Uh, because I was advocating this sort of layered approach for the and she didn't uh, understand we didn't understand each other at all and with your insistence on heritage in the in the downtown cairo i was wondering um if you're if you what what kind of reaction do you get is it really um, yeah. yeah yeah i mean that's that's a excellent comment from that student i think i think the the, the, the mainstream understanding of heritage as a static stylistic artifacts. So there's a new classical building that needs to be restored, uh, you know, uh, hollowed out from the residents and come back to what it's used to be perfect Belle Epoque, right? And that's very problematic because it takes away all the social and economic factors in that building. Mm -hmm. Our approach to heritage is that we acknowledge that it's a living heritage and downtown has multi layers of, you know, class and demographics and gender, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's already part of the heritage so downtown is not one layer it's many days it's like 250 years of layers so some shops went out and new shops came in some residents built on the roof etc we would like to maintain that but regulate it so we okay. think it's what the charm and the interest in an old city not only in cairo it's it's accumulation and to think of it as a process a living uh, mechanism organism rather than turn it into uh, an empty museum that is clean and shiny but it's it's boring yeah yeah i and completely I agree with you but only um i don't have to uh preach that in the netherlands because uh this is consensus in the netherlands uh but yes. there's one thing in which uh, egypt and um, the netherlands also have some similarity though also very uncomparable but this um this balance between formal and informal um, there is no informal sector really in the Netherlands or in Western Europe because, well, you know, this, we are very regulated and sometimes overregulated. But um, to a uh, degree, this also poses a problem because uh, the the way that our cities grow and are being transformed and uh, that the way that housing is uh, uh, developed, 
is also regulated in a way that um, communities or informal parties, I would say individuals or uh, small collectives, are completely ruled, ruled out and they don't get a seat at the table. So it's only um, uh, big developers, uh, governments, um, uh, cooperations, and uh, so there's no place for a, a really de democratic um, urban development. Mm. And that is also Thing that we're at the school that we're trying to do, like uh, co-op with um, housing cooperatives, for instance, like collectives uh, building their own buildings, all these things that uh, Cairo uh, exists. Well, also the 70% of informal development of Cairo is to some degree highly capitalistic. Eh? It's just not as of course. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I'm... <sighs> The question of informality within the global north is something we've been trying to understand, and maybe that's something we can work on. But I think the last decade or so, with these kind of uh, waves of uh, uh, immigrants coming to Europe, they're bringing with them their own understanding of public space, right? And that sometimes is in conflict with the uh, a norm, right, in, mm -hmm. in these cities. So I think it would be interesting in, to investigate how some certain neighborhoods and the streets, like in New York and Berlin, just to give an example. Uh, yeah. What is the difference between a sidewalk in New Köln and a sidewalk in the city center, right? And without yeah. judging it, good or bad, like what are the different uh, ways of people engaging, understanding, and approaching in the public space? And that could be yeah. an interesting point uh, to open up this debate and maybe unravel some of this over-regulation in the city. But it's definitely mm -hmm. seems very different from Cairo, which needs more regulation on, the, on, the, on, the, on this side and maybe in Europe. It needs to be a little bit deregulated, and that's something we can, from yeah. from a spatial perspective, not economic perspective. I think economically, True. yeah, pro regulation. Also, yeah. yeah, now of course it's also a systemic question and uh, economic because uh, also I don't want to romanticize the informal. Uh, it's just about um, sort of releasing the iron fist that the uh, real estate sector has on our cities, which is. Uh, by now really grabbing everyone's attention because of the housing prices which are soaring and uh, nobody can afford to live in uh, the big cities uh, like Amsterdam for instance uh, but also Rotterdam uh, anymore so that asks for different uh, approaches but um, I do agree with this use of public space which um, um, transforms in such a strong way from the city center moving outwards uh, connecting to different uh, uh, migrant communities, uh, etc. So that is extremely interesting. And um, especially because you're now also working in other uh, North African countries. Eh? Yes, yes. Yeah, we have projects in Tunis and Morocco and also Sub-Saharan Africa. So we started to go regionally in the last few years to come to sort of find, find alternatives to not able to do a lot of work on the ground. I think we're getting a note from the moderator that we're out of time. But uh, it's ready. been a pleasure to uh, talk to you again, Michelle. I, I really hope this would trigger collaboration soon once this uh, lifting, uh, once the travel restriction is lifted, we can find a way yes. to do something together. Great Please, to talk to you. Please, let's do that. It's, high, okay. it's time. It's time, yes. That's right. That's my dishonorable um, uh, um, duty to, uh, to, to, to signal the time. Thank you so much. What an inspiring... Um, inspiring conversation it just goes to show huh, how much the cultural and the political are intertwined but also the formal and informal um, in, uh, in in quite contradictory ways uh, thank you um, uh, michelle and thank you omar uh, this also brings us to the end thank you omar this also brings us to the end of this first series of artists in conversations um once again a uh, big thanks to Mahmoud, uh, Nat, Dahlia, Michelle and Omar for joining us today. And thank you all, uh, your viewers, for watching. Uh, the next edition, we will talk with artists from Australia. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.